Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Pasadena Photography Arts. I'm PPA co-director Douglas Hill. Welcome to our 46th open show, Family, the Ties that Bind, Unbind, featuring the work of four extraordinary, talented, and diverse artists, Kelly Curie, Janet Holmes, Ruth Todination, and Anya Tsarik. They are coming to us from Hawaii, Toronto, London, and Berlin, truly international. This installment of Open Show is being presented without benefit of an underwriter. However, if you would like to find out how you can underwrite a future event such as this, please email us. We are continuing to accept applications for the second annual Pasadena Photography Arts Photo Award. We're very excited that renowned gallerist Rose Shoshana of the Rose Gallery in Santa Monica has generously agreed to be this year's guest juror. So if you're interested in applying or know someone who might be, go to PasadenaPhotographyArts.org for further details. We look forward to seeing your applications. The deadline is March 29th, so I suggest you not waste time. A new photography print magazine has emerged in Los Angeles, Interpublic. I'm pleased to mention that my fellow uh, co-director, Ellen Friedlander, and advisor, Krishna Malhotra, are featured in the second issue, along with a number of other distinguished artists. Find out more by visiting interpublic.com. In our, um, our first in-person event in over four years will once again be presented at the Armory Center for the Arts in Pasadena this September. The Armory continues to provide a remarkable lineup of unique exhibitions and creative educational programs. We're very excited to once again call the Armory our home. Um, oh, sorry. And if you were with us uh, for last month's forum, you know that the ASMP's The Bridge is currently offering opportunities to 18 to 26 year olds uh, aspiring photographers for their 2024 mentorship program through April 24th. We're also really excited to be teaming up with Lori Freitag's, um, Freitag, sorry, um, Photo Curator LA. PPA co-director Ellen Friedlander and advisor Lori Pond will be serving as curators on the Global Photography Awards. And but before we go on with tonight's program, I wanted to say that we at PPA were saddened to learn that Las Fotos project um, experienced um, a break-in at the facility in East Los Angeles um, a few days ago. Um, the place was ransacked and about $65,000 worth of equipment was stolen. Las Fotos Project uses photography as a medium to mentor teenage girls and gender expansive youth of color through classes and community projects, as well as providing equipment for them to perform freelance jobs. I urge everyone to visit um, LA, I'm sorry, lasfotosproject.org to see how you can be of help to this very worthy organization. Um, I also wanted to mention that um, our founder, Bill Wishner, um, has made a, a, an extremely generous donation to um, help them with their um, uh, efforts to rebuild. So please support them as, uh, as you can. Joining us tonight as co-host is PPA advisor, the inimitable Lori Pond. Hi, Hi everybody. Lori. Thanks. Um, our first presenter is Anya Tsarik, a Ukrainian photographer based in Berlin. Following the full-scale Russian invasion of Ukraine, her work now focuses on documenting the consequences of war in her homeland. Through photography, she aims to raise awareness about the war and forced migration as one of the con its consequences, as well as to honor the resilience and strength of those impacted by it. Anya. Hello, thank you so much to everyone for joining. And thank you for giving me the space and the platform to talk about my project. I think it's, yeah, it's super important, especially now. Um, so on the 21st of February, 20, uh, 2022, People all over Ukraine woke up from explosions as Russia started the full-scale 
invasion of our homeland. And it was 4 a.m. and I was on the phone with my parents and we were deciding what should they do next? Should they stay in Ukraine or should they go somewhere? Should they leave? And my dad decided to stay and he joined the territory defense of our region. And my mom packed a little suitcase and over the night she left Ukraine and came to me in Berlin. And I should say that I left Ukraine when I was 17 years old. I was studying in Poland and then went to Berlin and would visit my parents maybe once per year for holidays. So we were, for a long time, we were not living our life together anymore. We were, we would meet up once per year or speak uh, on the phone and talk about how life is. But yeah, it was kind of a long term, a long, yeah, like long distance relationship between me and my my parents and when my mom came to Berlin we those relationships started to change very drastically because we actually started to live together again after eight years of the separation and the, it was also big, the big change because it was my territory it was my flat my rules and she had to adapt to it in a way and the dynamics of relationships started to change and uh, we started to have this shift of roles. So sometimes I would take a parent role and would take care of her, would help her with documents or like such simple actions as going to a supermarket. Um, but also other times she would take this parent and mother's role back and would um, help me out or like she would cook me a dinner or braid my hair and of course, the experience of the war is a life changing and it changed not only our relationship, but also the life of each of us separately. And everything really changed, like the perception of the world, of humanity, of your country and self-identity, belonging and somehow the range of feelings became really extreme so if before like you could feel I'm sad and I'm happy like this range became extremely big so yeah like the sadness would be so deep and pain would be so deep and the happiness would be just I don't know a hundred times stronger and that's when those changes needed to be visualized and that was when I took my camera and yeah it was also really important for me to give my mom a voice in some way in this project and that's how we recorded the songs that I remembered from my childhood because my mom she's a singer and she would always sing me um, lullabies before going to sleep and it was always as many lullabies as many years I was until I was five so until I was five years old like she would sing me every evening a concert with those amazing Ukrainian songs and when I was five I decided that I'm too too cool for that that I'm too old and I was I asked my mom to not sing me anymore and it was yeah like this moment on the first day of the full-scale invasion before that before going to sleep, I felt this very strong need to hear my mom's lullaby. And it was like this only thing that could calm me down in some way. And I asked her to sing to me and she recorded me an audio message, a messenger singing one of the songs. But it was a very sad moment as well because she told me that I want to sing to you when you are happy and I am happy. And yeah, she, yeah, but ho holding her tears back, she, she sent me this message. So when she arrived to Berlin, we recorded, I think, 13 songs that I remember from my childhood. And five of them became part of the project. And um, yeah, in this way, also, it was important for me to save those songs from disappearing because Russia has been trying to um destroy ukrainian heritage since centuries not only for the past two years or past 10 years it's always being connected to assimilation to yeah like to just destroying everything ukrainian to and yeah like 
So it was important for me to save those songs from disappearing as well. And we can listen to a fragment of uh, one song, which is called Five Swans. Yeah. <laughs> Сестричок любих доньок матір звеселяли. П'ять сестричок, п'ять лебідок в садочку гуляли. Щирі серцем всім привітні в росах виростали. Завітали у садочок хлопці ясночолі, приглянули, покохали, поєднали долі, розлетілися сестрички по рідній в країні, зарони. Мати смуток в тернову хустину. Thank you. And um, yeah, like I think that in the image that we we see now, you can see the this roll switch because, for example, smoking for me was always like this thing that my mom really doesn't like the fact that I smoke. I think it's every mom really. And yeah, like, but because it was my flat, like she kind of had to agree to that. And you can see in her eyes that she really, really doesn't like it. But it, she still let me even include it in, into the photo project. So she, I was like, yeah, okay, mom, we're going to make this photograph. I will smoke next to you. And she's like, yeah, okay, no problem. Yeah, so I'm really, it would not have been possible to make this project if not her also i think trust and her like trust to the process and um and trust to me and it was also really important for me to break this two-dimensional refugee representation in some way because i feel like this representation is very often either depicts like in media the refugees as beggars using the country's resources in health, housing and education and a threat in some way or representation of that portraits people like refugees as desperate people trapped by tragic circumstances and limits like very complex identities only to that and it's really problematic I guess I think and for me it was also really crucial to combine this complexity of a person who is a mother who is a um, refugee but who is also a professor of music who was who used to be uh, in yeah in Ukraine and um, yeah because I feel like we perceive the war and yeah like a, lo a lot through photography and um, that's how we form also our image of either refugees or Ukrainians as well in, in media, which are very often simplified. And yeah, like the project, uh, the process of creating motherland was really intuitive. And now I discover a lot of connections and meanings which were not planned rationally, but appeared there rather strong conscious pro process. One of this like was the decision to include myself in the work, for example. It was nothing that I was like, okay, so I have to photograph myself and my mom because we are going through it. It was starting with this impulse to photograph my mom. And then somehow it made sense that I was the part of this work as well as um, yeah, being in the photographs. Yeah. I think that's it from my side. And I would love to know from you um when you're making your work how do you want people to feel when they are looking at your work i 
I think like my work, it's very, very personal, but at the same time, it also give the space for others to relate in one or other way. And it necessar sh shouldn't necessarily, um, you should not be through very similar experiences necessarily. I think that um, thinking or reflecting on themselves as daughters maybe or mothers or um, citizens and I think I would like others to reflect um yeah on their life in in some way and their sim similar mm -hmm. um, there yeah. there's such a tenderness that comes through between the two of you in this work it's so obvious and it's such a loving trusting look that you both have and you. you know as horrible as this war has been it has actually brought you and your mother together closer yeah um, definitely yeah definitely i, I wish it had never happened still. I, know, I know what kind of photographic work were you doing prior to the events of the war i think it was more general things i was photographing my friends i was yeah photographing berlin it was nothing like motherland is my first long-term project really and it emerged out of this need to visualize my personal feelings and transformations in my life as a Ukrainian, as a daughter, and yeah, as a Ukrainian living abroad as well. I think it's so important that you are representing what you said about refugees and how they're perceived in the media. And your work shows the other side of what a, who a refugee is and where they come from. And they're not all poor people, you know, they're educated, they're sophisticated. Uh, so it's really important um, to show that, I think, because we get one line from the media and we don't see the personal stories like your work is presenting in such a beautiful way. Thank you so much. You're so yeah. welcome. Thank you. I make a Thank quick comment, if you don't mind. Um, this actually touched me more than I thought it would. Uh, of course, it's not surprising. My grandparents came from the Ukraine, from Kiev, and uh, there, for the love of God, my my pictures could have been your pictures. You know, it, it's we're all refugees in that regard. We're all immigrants. You know, most of us are. I don't know anybody that isn't. And you know, in my extended family and my friends. We all come from different countries, and a lot of us come from the Ukraine. So, uh, again, I, I applaud you for doing this. I think this is a wonderful project that's quite personal, but the broader implications of it, of course, are that each of us has a motherland. And, um, you know, we could have been in the same boat you are now many years ago yeah thank you so much yeah that's true yeah no one expects it yeah um do you uh think you'll be in berlin for a while or is this just a temporary stopping point for you it's home for me now oh. it is home for me and I live here for four years already and before I was living in Poland and now I'm actually working on a new project in Ukraine um so I'm coming there um like it was three times already but I, I'm planning to, to go back more and yeah I feel like I am like when I come back to Berlin I feel like I'm, I, I come home it's very and how about your mom? Does she feel that way too? Her first visit to Ukraine was actually, she came back like a week ago. Mm -hmm. and yeah, I guess she feel that way too. But for her, it's much more 
yeah. complicated I guess than for me because I, I moved out when I was 17 and it's very I have of course it's yeah it's very charged place for me and it is the place that I come from and I have a lot I explore and of course that's who I am in some way but the home I built is in Berlin and I, it's actually what I also explored my new project a lot that this idea of safety at home um because a lot of people ask me like yeah is your family safe and I'm like I don't know what to answer I don't really have an answer because it's all it's all the safety is always in comparison there is no thing like a safe place or safe space and I explored this idea of safety of myself also when coming back to Ukraine in the place in home which which is considered to be the safest space and safest place and often it is not yeah thank well, you Anna. I, I can't wait to hear about your next project and um thank you again for your presentation it was really well done beautiful work thank, thank you, you so much I really appreciate all of the yeah, all of your also stories and your um yeah feedback. Thank you so much. Thank you. Our next presenter, Ruth Toda Nation. Um, her photographic practice is informed by a, a nomadic childhood, bringing two cultures, Japan and Britain, um, together. Um, she, I'm sorry, bridging two cultures, Japan and Britain. Um, she began photographing in Liverpool in the 1980s and later in the rural areas of northern Japan. She continues to document the communities where she lives. Her intimate approach interweaves themes navigating family dynamics and community bonds while reflecting an aging, lonely, uh, an aging loneliness, transience, and departure. Ruth brings a unique perspective to her photography using images and words drawn from interviews and conversations with her subjects. Her first photo textbook, Our Lockdown Garden, was published by the Mindful Editions in 2022. Her most recent body of work, Love is a Love Life Story, won the Royal Photographic Society's Documentary Photography Award 2023 and will be in a UK, UK touring exhibition beginning in May 2024. Ruth. Hi. <laughs> Are you going to run through the pictures first? Oh, okay. Yeah, so um, I began photographing this work about four years ago, um, and it began just as a dab project, um, which is still ongoing. Um, I began that work really because I was acting as a carer to my father and I was finding it really difficult. So I began to pick up my camera to try and find a way to explore my feelings around that and um, I began writing and so on. Um, I hadn't actually, I was photographing early on in my life um, in Liverpool and in Northern Japan, um, but I put my camera away for about 20 years. So this was a real kind of beginning for me, um, documenting my father and that project is still ongoing. Um, I suppose my objectives for documenting my father was about reconciliation 
and just understanding my own unresolved feelings in our relationship and also to share the difficulties I was having as a carer dealing with agencies and sort of navigating that whole thing I mean there's no manual about how to be a carer just as there's no manual about how to be a parent so I wanted to share that with other people and also just open up the dialogue around dying and aging and all the things that we don't really want to talk about but I think it's really important to talk about and it was also quite a beautiful process some of it was very difficult seeing my father in his 90s and aging but it was also something very beautiful about that whole process that I wanted to honor um so as I was doing this project obviously we all went into COVID-19 so this kind of changed the dynamic of the project slightly in that I was now locked out <laughs> of my father's facility um, and I had to sort of function around that situation. And then living next door, you'll see in picture number one, the Mary and my father, John. And Mary lived in one flat and my father lived opposite the corridor. And it was really all about, it began, the, the, the whole project became about their relationship. It was just so touching and so fascinating to me. And there were so many parallels between these two people because Mary had been a nurse and she, she was a retired nurse. She'd been a nurse for NHS nurse for years. And my father had been a Christian minister and a missionary. So they're both dedicated their lives to other people so it was really all about their relationship and how the way friendship replaced family because I was living near enough to the facility within the COVID regulations which were confusing um, but I was allowed we were allowed a, a one daily exercise so I used to get on my bike and cycle along and um, initially we could only go in their garden and that's where I made the um, our lockdown garden book which is interviews with lots of people in the facility and um, everybody uh, in their 80s and 90s but then when we were going in and out I were, was able to go into the building or visit certain places with them and really family other family members couldn't get there and John and Mary almost became a family unit and um, that's how the work kind of progressed. Um, but then as time went on, it became that there was an internal dialogue going on about loss and love and friendship and community, but it also became a voice. Uh, I wanted to give a voice to the older generation because at the time in the UK, and this, you know, this probably runs parallel to a lot of other countries and the universal things that we are all suffering or we all suffered at that time, but what was happening in the UK is that the government was sending untested um, people, older people back into care homes, and that resulted in thousands of excess deaths. It was, it was a really tragic, really extreme situation. So I just felt that they were the most unseen cohort of people, but equally they were the most affected with the highest number of, of deaths. Um, and also there's this feeling, you know, that they just would never come out of lockdown. And during this period, you know, Mary was becoming, um, she was a lovely, lovely lady. She was from uh, Jarrow in the north and um, very warm and always talking and full of all her memories. But what was happening is she was slowly um, losing her memory. But because we couldn't get the care for her, you know, and her family couldn't really attend. She was just sort of drifting into this place. And eventually um, her family were able to move her into a full um, care home, which was good and bad. But <clears throat> beyond that point, we could just, <clears throat> we never saw Mary again. Um, so you'll see in the middle, um, we were allowed in a pod and they met in the pod. And um, that was just the way she finally left us. Um, the most awful thing was once she was in there, she felt that she was locked away. She felt that she was imprisoned and she felt that she was being punished and she could never fully understand um, the pandemic. So um, 
it was really that my personal relationship with John and Mary was sort of epitomized everything I felt was happening around the world and also in our country. Um, and it was a story of such universal values. I've written down some of the themes that I feel permeate the work. Um, just, I'm just gonna say some themes, It'd be interesting to know if um, it resonates with anybody or the work conjures this for people. Friendship, faith, community, sharing, caring, memories, and love and loss. That was the kind of internal dialogue going on. Um, and all of this was against the political backdrop of the failing care system and the pressure on um, family carers. Um, the care system in the UK at the moment is really not good at all. It hasn't fully got back on its feet since COVID. Um, it's really struggling. Uh, and some family members are still struggling to get in to see people in care homes. So it's a it's an ongoing issue. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about the process because I think it's quite interesting. Um, I haven't included any of my words here. I just didn't it didn't come up in, in the way it was presented. But all through the work I was um, writing. So I, I was actually recording. I've got a whole load of recordings of Mary speaking my father speaking, us in the pod, everything that was going on is recorded. Um, I would take out bits and I write it with my images and I'm hoping to make a sort of three-dimensional screens with the voices and what was happening at the time um, politically and the announcements and so on. Um, I shot everything on film. Um, really when I picked up my camera again after 20 years, I was so scared to do it. I just, I always wanted to do it. It was a dream. It was in the back of my cupboard. I wanted to pull it back out, but just being a single parent, parenting, caring, having to work, it just all went on the back burner. But with my son's pressure, I really went back to it. But my sort of objective was to just start where I ended. And that was back to 35 millimeter Nikon's film, very basic, um, all about the feeling, all about the people. Um, yeah, and that that's kind of what I came up with. And my vi visualization that linked with my sort of internal dialogue, I shot everything um, landscape. And it's because I really saw it as a book. It was a story every day, the COVID regulations, everything was the same. Everything in that sense was the same story. It was moving a little bit, but everything about John and Mary was different. There was real progress, you know, you could see Mary was deteriorating, we were moving. And it was like I was, every day I was turning a page of a book. There's a lot more pictures than these 15. Um, so that that was kind of how it, how I was visualizing it. Um, it's a storybook. It has a beginning and it has a physical end in that sense because Mary eventually died. But in the spiritual sense, it, you know, it's, I don't think it's ended. I mean, spirituality is eternal anyway. And also dad's story is still going on. So it's never ending. Um, the thing that is sort of the thread through the whole thing, I suppose, is that John and Mary had a strong faith. Um, it kept coming up all the time and it's really what sustained them and the friendship between them, their faith and the community. And um, yeah, it was, it's just a very sad story. In the end, Mary, you know, she died. We never saw her again. And she died believing she'd been locked away. Yeah. You no, know, your, your images show such a poignancy to them. You reflect in your images what you're telling us now. And I can yeah. see the closeness between them. It's so evident and how they look at each other and mm. how they're, you know, at different uh, ends of the arc, you know, really devastated, depressed, lonely, fearful on one end. And at the other end, you know, wonderful companions got, can laugh together. And it's just wonderful series. You've really captured their relationship in a wonderful way. 
Yeah. And, I really and, want, yeah. I really like the fact that you have spotlighted this particular group of people as well. Because um, you know, in in the US, the situation is very similar with healthcare. The elderly yeah. are forgotten. And um, there's more and more people in our country that are living alone. And yeah. it's 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 going to be a massive problem because baby boomers are getting older and they need special care and it's just not there. Yeah, yeah. So I applaud you on many levels for considering and bringing to light this group of people who need to be seen and yeah. show their humanity and they're they're just wonderful i mean look at the expression on her face it's just beatific you know she was a, such an amazing character i mean you know you just would want to photograph mary she was such a special soul i mean yeah yeah um, i can see that I think, I think in the work it was for me it was all about the emotion and capturing that and those fleeting moments in time. Um, um, I'm really curious to know what kind of photographic work you did before you put your camera down. Uh, well, I did, well, I started, um, so when I returned from Japan, because my parents were missionaries out there for a long time. So I came back to the UK when I was about 12. Um, and then I left school at 16, I went to an art college and there I picked up a camera for the first time. And I was documenting on the streets of Liverpool. Um, it, it, it's a, it was a little bit different. I was working in color, I was trying medium format, but it was basically still all about the people. Um, the work, that work you can see on a website, a big website in the UK called the British Culture Archive. Um, I've, I've the work is up there and I've written sort of what I was doing at that time and then in Japan I progressed I was working commercially but I um, was working on personal projects so um, similar in a way to this it still had themes to do with aging and um, death and I suppose because my father was a minister you know dying and uh, those sorts of things were always part of our dialogue at home it was mm -hmm. never a taboo subject. Um, so yeah, I was working on projects in Japan of a similar nature and well, quite different, but it, the th thematically quite similar. Mm. Well, it prepared you well to really delve into this emotional project, which yeah. is fascinating. And I hope a lot of people get to see it. Thank you so much Thank for your you. presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. Thank you. Our next presenter, Janet Holmes, always loved animals, but for many years she was afraid to get involved with rescuing them because she couldn't imagine how she would deal with the heartbreak. She was almost 50 when she finally acknowledged that animals needed her more than she needed to be comfortable. And so she began volunteering with rescue groups as a caregiver and photographer. As she spent time experiencing animals as individuals through the lens of my um, as I, as well, yeah, lens of her camera, she began to question how she could profess to love them, yet continue exploiting them for food, clothing, and other, sorry, um, other materials. She committed to becoming vegan and used photography to advocate for animal liberation. As a photographer, Janet works in a nonprofit base on a nonprofit basis, donating her services and profits to support animal rescue. She was recognized by Photo Lucida as a critical mass top 200 finalist in 2017 and 2018, and won the United Photo Industries People's Choice Award in 2018 for her series on rescued chickens. Included in the national edition of The Fence, Kara Verlag published her photo book, Nest, Rescued Chickens at Home in 2020. Fun fact about uh, Janet, turkeys changed the trajectory of her life. Janet? Hi there, thanks very much. Um, I'm really excited to be here and I really appreciate the opportunity that Pasadena Photography Arts has given me to, to share this work and, and see the other beautiful work. Um, 
I think, you know, this project started in January 2017 when I was volunteering at the Wild Bird Fund in New York City, where I used to live. Um, although the fund, you know, by its name, obviously focuses on wild birds, we would occasionally have chickens. Um, and we, while I was there one day, as I said, in January, we were treating a hen with severe and chronic reproductive illness. Um, I'd, I'd been vegan for a few years by that point and didn't realize that egg laying was such a problem for chickens. I had thought that it was a much more natural uh, process, but I learned actually that compared with their wild ancestors, modern hens, especially the egg laying hens, um, have been sort of bred over generations and generations to lay hundreds of eggs each year compared to sort of the 10 or 20 that say their wild ancestors would have laid. Um, and their bodies really can't handle that. They suffer from osteoporosis because of the calcium that they use in order to put shells around the eggs. Um, they develop um, abdominal infections, um, prolapsed organs, um, and have very high rates of reproductive cancer. Um, even well-fed and well-loved hens um, who are sort of the ones who lay a lot of eggs can suffer from these same problems. Um, because the hen was sort of nearing the end of kind of the acute stage of her illness, we were looking for a place where she could live and somebody who could really afford the, the high vet bills that she likely would have for the rest of her life. And so I started contacting farm animal sanctuaries and my friends in the rescue community to see if I could find a home for her. And in that process, I started connecting with a network of people and primarily vegan women who were rescuing and caring for chickens at home. Um, one of them adopted the hen. Um, and that experience got me thinking about really how we've been socialized to think that it's normal to exploit the reproductive systems of chickens and certain other animals. And of course, I couldn't help thinking about how there are people and government seeking and often succeeding at controlling the reproductive functions of humans with wombs. I mean, really, in January 2017 in the United States, it was really hard not to make the connection um, between reproductive rights, reproductive health, and hens and humans. Uh, and that's really the start of the project. I thought I wanted to start making portraits of the hens and the people who rescued them and cared for them at home. And this is really, these living arrangements are sort of part of what is known as the micro sanctuary movement, um, where people provide safe homes for rescued animals that we don't traditionally think of as companion animals. So it might be chickens or other farmed animals or um, you know, sort of fish or rats or otherwise. And they prioritize really kind of the safety, the well-being and the, and the health of those animals. And as I said, live with them in a home setting. Initially in the project, I started by photographing my friends um, and people close to my friends in the New York City area. Ultimately, um, I've made project portraits of about 40 people mainly in the United States, but also in Canada, the United Kingdom, and there was even a skateboarding chicken in Norway I visited. Um, you might wonder how I found my subjects. Um, the short answer is Facebook um, and the wonder of private Facebook groups. So I met people through these groups online. They helped me connect with other people and so on. Um, I planned trips to photograph certain people. And when I did that, I would share my itinerary in the private group and encourage people to contact me or to contact their friends and have them contact me. And that's sort of how the, how the network grew. Initially, the project, as I said, focused on hens and vegan women. Um, but I was very quickly educated by the humans that there were a wider range of issues. I mean, for example, um, what about the roosters? Who are born to laying hens. Um, nobody needs them or wants them. And so they're often killed if it's possible to identify their sex shortly after they're born. If you can't identify their sex, and it's often difficult to identify their sex, when they start crowing, um, they might be dumped um, or worse. 
even people who have backyard hens, for example, and suddenly discover that they've got roosters in their flock and love their roosters may end up sort of trying to find homes for them because they live in a place that is zoned to only allow hens, not roosters. Uh, I also started photographing chickens rescued from other situations. So there are portraits of chicks, you know, rescued after an elementary school hatching project concluded and suddenly there were birds that needed homes. I photographed roosters rescued from cockfighting rings. Um, I photographed chickens that were liberated from factory farms, from religious sacrifice rituals, um, and um, from hoarding situations. So um, kind of turning away from a little bit of the difficulty of that subject, I think one of the other things that comes up in the project was um, kind of the, the practical challenge of making portraits in places that I wasn't familiar with. I mean, I was, so to speak, flying blind um, when I came to the environments. Um, I'd arrive for a photo session at someone's house. Um, we'd look around for a place to make a portrait that reflected the chicken's lived environment, but maybe a little bit tidied up. So we'd clean up some of the poop. Um, we'd maybe lock up temporarily some of the more rambunctious family members like the toddlers and the pigs and the turkeys um, and the rats and try and focus on the chickens for a little while and sort of make something kind of in a small space. Um, and I think Arnold, uh, sort of Newman's quote, photography is 1% talent and 99% moving furniture um, really was important in this project in terms of the images that we created. Partway through the project, I created a photo book through Blur to share as a gift to the, the people who participated in the project and also to raise awareness of it. And that led to another important lesson. Um, one of my subjects um, told me that she'd shared the book uh, at an event and somebody picked it up, started flipping through it with a great deal of interest and then put it down and said, it's hard to picture myself doing this. Um, and it was hard to picture herself doing this because most of the people I'd photographed up until that point were Caucasian women. They were the people who had volunteered for the project. And I realized in that moment that I needed to take a more deliberate and proactive approach to make the series more diverse. Um, I wanted to ensure that anybody could picture themselves with a micro sanctuary for chickens or you know, other farmed animals. The most significant challenge I faced with this project was this dichotomy, I think that you may be able to sense as we go through these images between these peaceful and joyful and sometimes really funny photographs of these amazing birds and the really disturbing backstories I was learning as I went through this project. Almost every single chicken I photographed for this project had been exploited, neglected, abused or abandoned. Um, and kind of at this stage, I'd say probably over half of them have died um, because something had happened in their life or there was some aspect of their genetics or their makeup that sort of gave them a, a less than natural full life. So I wanted to sort of share that experience, but I wanted to make this a project about more than just their past suffering because they are more than just their past suffering. There were two photographers whose projects really influenced what I was going to do. Um, one of them is Mary Shannon Johnstone and her project Landfill Dogs. She photographed dogs on what you might call day release from the local animal shelter, playing in a beautiful park. That beautiful park called Landfill Park was actually a capped landfill and underneath it were tens of thousands of dogs and cats that the county had euthanized because nobody wanted those animals. The second photographer is Martin Osborne um, and his book, Where Hunting Dogs Rest. He photographed Spanish hunting dogs who had been rescued after being abused for sort of poor performance during the hunting season or who had been abandoned at the end of the hunting season. And what he did was he photographed the landscapes where the dogs had been found 
and then sort of took the, the colors and the mood from that scene and created a studio environment where he photographed the rescued dogs and paired those images together. Um, I think like those photographers, I was making images that didn't really deal directly with the underlying pain of the animal's experience. I decided the best way to do justice to the chickens and their people was to publish a book that punctuated kind of these images of sanctuary um, really with short essays written by some of the rescuers who told their companion stories. And then I also included some of um, my own writing to provide some background on some of the issues that I've talked about around health issues and other ones. Um, in 2019, I was very fortunate to connect with Alexa Becker um, from Kier Verlag, and that was the publisher who had, uh, that had done um, Where Hunting Dogs Rest. And I was really excited that they took on the project and we published the book Nest Rescued Chickens at Home in 2020. I think, you know, ultimately my hope is that this project is an invitation to people, um, an invitation to ask why do we see some animals as family and other animals as food? Um, and, and then having been socialized really to see farmed animals as food, what can we do to see them as individuals with personalities of their own um, who really want what we want? I think a safe home, companionship, the chance to live a full life. I think that's very important what you just said over everything else that you said, the whole idea of looking at fellow sentient beings as just that, not food. Yeah. They are sentient beings on this planet yeah. that we all share. And yeah. I applaud you for your amazing work. And I just have one question. I'm just wondering, do you have a personal relationship with any chickens right now? Um, I have an ongoing relationship with this amazing rooster. I mean, he doesn't live near me, but Bree, the rooster, <laughs> who's been on TV, um, and he's the companion of Camille. This is Camille and Brie. Oh. Um, and I, I know Brie from when he was just a little baby starting, starting to crow. And Camille actually, we lived in, she lived in Brooklyn at the time, made, had to make a tough decision because Brooklyn doesn't allow roosters mm -hmm. to, to sort of keep her home in Brooklyn or keep her rooster. And she made the choice to keep her rooster and moved home to Ohio uh, to live with her parents where Brie is allowed to live as part of the family. And so Brie and I meet up from time to time, uh, mostly <laughs> at Caskell Animal Sanctuary. He participates in some photo shoots. Um, he's an amazing character. Um, and uh, so there's that. I also briefly sheltered a uh, rescued cockfighting rooster in our basement after we retrieved him from a park in Scarborough near where I live. Um, and before we were able to transport him to uh, a sanctuary um, a little bit Wonderful. north of us in Toronto. Wonderful. Um, again, I, I can't tell you enough how much I am impressed by what you've done with these subjects and their birds. And you've brought a whole new okay. viewpoint to how people look at farm animals. And uh, thank you so much for doing that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Janet. Our next presenter, Kelly Cure, is a visual artist born and raised on Chicago's South Side. Rooted in personal experiences, she is interested in exploring moments of self-discovery, the misalignment in thought, psychology, and the myth of paradise. Utilizing a range of techniques, her artistic interest lies somewhere inside the kaleidoscope of what is true and what is imagined. But as the cliche goes, reality is often stranger than fiction. Kire's work has been exhibited nationally in both group and so solo shows, recently including the Hawaii State Art Museum, the Rhode Island Center for Photographic Arts, the Florida Museum of Photographic Arts, Shockbox Gallery in Los Angeles, and Box 13 Art Space in Houston, among others. Kire received her MFA from the University of Hawaii in Manoa in 2017 and currently lives and works in Honolulu. Kelly. Thank you. So difficult to go after these three 
amazing artists. Um, so as Doug said, my um, project that I'm going to talk about today is titled Artificial Sweetener. And um, these images were primarily made and taken um, during my grad school experience a couple years back. Um, and so I spent almost three years exploring my family photographs, as well as um, self-portraiture in this kind of off-putting way that you'll see here. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, I like to say that this work is an exploration of psychological stickiness. Um, so using certain material, which is usually some sort of very gooey type of food, um, using that as a subject, exploring the stickiness of certain spaces, in my mind that I've kind of internalized from family experiences. So the materials that I use in these in these photos that we're kind of just scrolling through here are often heavy. They're sweet, really sugar-based artificial ingredients, um, you know, used in processed foods, baked goods. Um, a lot of these materials that I'm using were candies that I or things that I ate as a kid or maybe played with, like Play-Doh and things like that. Um, but they kind of express both an excess and an absence to me. So they are the epitome of junk foods. They're really high in additives, artificial ingredients, um, but provide no value to the human body, oftentimes, as we know, you know, causing it harm. So kind of exploring this duality within the images. Um, and so at some point um, around my second year of grad school, I went back to Chicago, where I'm from. And I stumbled across several of my mom's recipes, along with boxes of photographs from my siblings and my childhood um, at my mom's house, at my grandmother's house, at my aunt's house. So just kind of exploring these photographs, some that I hadn't looked at in years and some that I had never really seen before. And there were tons and tons of photos. So anything from photo of us, photos of us, you know, in the backyard, running through the sprinkler in the summer, um, holidays, birthdays, tons of birthday photographs. Um, and those were the ones, there's a lot of them in here. Those were the ones that I ended up feeling really drawn to. Um, and I think because those were ones I felt falsified my memories the most. So when I looked at them, I felt like it was, there was a um, missing piece between my memory and that image. So at that point, I kind of knew I wanted to make work about my childhood or past family experiences, but I didn't really know what the project was going to be. I was kind of hesitant to go down that road. Um, but going through these photos, you know, looking at the family photos, I noticed how many of the photographs sparked a memory in my mind or, um, you know, brought me back to that moment of a birthday party or an activity or even just kind of a period in my life, um, often of things that maybe I didn't want to remember or hadn't remembered until looking at that particular photo. Um, but I also noticed that the photographs that I was looking at often portrayed a false version of the past or the past that I remembered. So how many standard poses, um, celebrations, even the presence of certain people in the images just didn't really add up to the memories that I had about that moment or that time period. And some of the photos that I was looking at, I had a really strong reaction and just kind of wanted to toss them aside, maybe just forget about them, put them back in the box and not think about them, um, which would have, of course, been the most comfortable thing to do. But instead, I, I took a stack of them. I brought them back to Hawaii with me and and made work about it. So you know, as an artist, like thinking about what we do with difficult moments, difficult memories, you know, how to translate these things um, into our work. And so um, this project, I was really interested in the dialogue that kind of surrounds rethinking photographic evidence, particularly with family narration um, and how images can be used in ways to kind of recontextualize subject matter and to question the reality or truth of past events. And so um, I've combined several variations of images within this series to work together 
as a cohesive um, group of images. So it's a collection of my found family photographs, um, manipulated family photos, so kind of um, manipulated with some sort of material and then re-photographed or scanned, um, and then performative kind of stage studio um, portraits, which act as self-portraits. So um, within that, especially within the self-portraits, I have a very repetitive, almost obsessive way to make these images or the process itself. Um, and so including these self-portraits in this work was a way to talk about the response I have to the family history that I was exploring in a very physical and even kind of ironic sort of way. Uh, so the stickiness that I'm talking about, this kind of psychological hold that wraps around the memories that I have in my mind comes out onto the images or onto myself with the substances that I'm using. So kind of insinuating this sickly sugary overload, you know, when you eat too much sugar, you have this, you crash, you know, you have um, this overload of stuff or kind of even like a suff suffocation or an emotional unease. And um, looking at these pictures, I they can be humorous at first glance. That's kind of what the goal was. Um, you know, when you see them, they're a little bit off-putting. They can be humorous, even, you know, sarcastic in delivery, um, but a way to express the feeling of being, you know, stuck to a thought or a feeling or someone even that um, becomes seen through this excessive use of stuff on the physical body. So really making it very physical um, to have that sort of reaction. And it also can kind of talk about defense mechanisms, you know, that I have, or many of us have brushing things off with humor, kind of adding a sarcastic overtone to the delivery of images or work or, or words. Um, and so doing this was, my aim was to experience a moment that act as, acted as a truer version of oftentimes very complicated family connections or very complicated past. You know, um, when I look at the applied materials on the photos, it creates a barrier that becomes almost emotional for me. Mm. Um, and I wonder if that was part of your objective to create that kind of emotional barrier between the viewer and the subject of the photograph. Definitely. I think in a majority of the self-portraits and a lot of the re-photographed family photos, there's um, either the eye contact is not there or it's or there's a barrier between the camera and the self or the person or whatever it is kind of blocking that direct connection. Um, there's only a rare few that have that sort of like confrontational eye contact. So Having the That's one of my favorites, that blue explosion there. Can you talk about that photo in particular and what it means to you and who's in the photo? Yeah, so um, this is my mother and um, this is actually jello before it becomes the the jello once you know you add the water to it. So it's the powdered version of jello. Um, it is the same color as the jello that she's actually making in the photo so mm -hmm. um a lot of the work is I think you know using material that I was familiar with very like artificial ingredients um things that were easy to make and that you know like a working single mother only has so much time to make certain meals and think you know have has that time to um in an inexpensive way as well so using those materials that I was familiar with and also create that kind of like, well, not to mention the pop of color, that artificial <laughs> blue. Mm -hmm. um, but it, you know, brings me back to that moment in that place with the use of the material. So before this project, what kinds of uh, photographic images did you make? What led you to this particular project? So before this project, I um, was doing a lot of self-portraits just kind of based on place. So I had moved from Chicago to Hawaii, not knowing anybody, um, didn't have 
other people to help, you know, make portraits with, didn't really know my surroundings, didn't know place. So I was using what I had, um, you know, what I knew and what I had around me and just kind of working in that way. And I think that's a lot of the reason why there's self-portraits involved in this project, because it was my kind of way of um, coping with changes and different situations and just kind of having almost like a catharsis to the new experiences. Yeah, I can see a lot of cathartic moments happening in these images. I mean, they're very emotional. And you're right. I mean, when I first looked at them, I laughed because they were so ridiculous. You know, it's just blobs of stuff everywhere. And the more I looked at them, I thought, wow, there's some covering up going on here of real emotion and place. And it's really interesting. Um when you were looking through the photos, did you remember your place in them on all of them? Or were there some that you didn't recognize at all? Yeah, there were quite a few that I either didn't remember that time or that, you know, that day, of course, looking back at childhood, that's to be expected, but especially significant moments like birthdays or holidays, having those experiences where I'm like oh I don't remember that or I don't remember being at this place or those people being here so it was kind of off-putting to have that um, disconnect between the memories I had and then looking at what we would once consider like proof of that day or that oh, moment exactly um, I have one more question for you and I'm really curious to know what do you like most about photography <laughs> Um, I think, well, what I like most about photography, firstly, is the way it can record light and it can bring us into a space so deeply in that particular way. Um, but I also, I think the thing I like about photography the most is its ability to contradict itself. You know, we can capture really specific moments in time that might never exist again, but then we also have this ability to interpret the moment in so many different ways and almost morph that moment to be what we create. Um, so, you know, I think at least for me, there was this inherent thought that photographs capture reality, especially when I was younger and I first started, but knowing that we can make these photos in these moments kind of be whatever we want or remember them in a way that might be different from what we actually see. So I think that contradiction is something I really drawn to. Kelly, I so enjoyed looking at your work on so many levels and I'm, it's so unique. Thank you. Uh, I really, really think it's wonderful work and I thank you for your really fun presentation of it. Thank you. So that's our show, everybody. We've talked to four photographers who have varying uh, projects, very unique projects, and everybody was fantastic tonight. I'm so glad to present you four, and I wish you nothing but the best in your future photographic endeavors. And we will keep in touch and try to help you publicize your work. So thanks again. Thank you. Thank you.